Woodhouse Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram is bringing you more this holiday season. Finishing the year with big savings on the entire model lineup during the Wrap Up the Year sales event. Save up to $13,000 off MSRP on a 2024 Ram 1500 Crew Cab Laramie 4x4 for qualified buyers. Explore all our year-end lease and finance deals at WoodhouseCDJRBellevue.com or WoodhouseChryslerJeepDodge.com. This is Woodhouse. With approved credit, tax title, license, extra. When financed with Chrysler Capital, $299 dot fee to its signing. Stock number BC240134. Offer expires 12 31 2023 See dealer for details. This is a CNA podcast. I saw somebody <laughs> lying on the road and they were wearing the costume. <laughs> so I, just, I was so sorry for them. A night that was supposed to be full of Halloween revelry turned into a national tragedy. One of those in the crowd was Chol Jung, whom you just heard there. The young man wiped tears from his eyes as he recalled the horrors of the crowd crush in Itaewon, Seoul's international district. He survived, but more than 150 others didn't. Investigators scoured the debris littering the narrow alleyway where most of the victims died. Clutching cameras, looking for clues to answer questions we're all asking. How could so many people cram into such a tiny space? Didn't authorities anticipate a potential overcrowding problem? And how is a nation in mourning going to get past the senseless loss of so many young lives? On today's edition, we speak to Lim Yun Suk, who headed straight to the scene off a flight from Singapore. Yun Suk joins me now. Hi, Yun Suk. Hello, Teresa. Yun Suk, there was a mad rush to cover this story because you had actually just left Seoul a day before and you were in Singapore when the story broke. Where exactly were you? Tell us about events leading up to you arriving on scene. Well, yes, I was. I was in Singapore on Saturday for the CNA retreat, which was going to start on Monday. And I was really looking forward to that because this was my first time back in Singapore in about three years since the pandemic outbreak. Now, I had dinner in Singapore on Saturday and I went to sleep before midnight. But slightly after midnight, I started getting messages from colleagues saying that, an accident had happened at Itaewon, but at that time, it was estimated that about 30 to 40 people or so had cardiac arrest and they were receiving treatment. Now, I saw that, and because I was in Singapore, I thought, okay, I can't do much now. I'll monitor the news in the morning, and I admit I went back to sleep. But around 4 o'clock in the morning, I had more messages popping out on my phone. My sister messaged me, and she even called me saying that this was getting really serious, that more than 100 people had died and more than 100 injured including foreigners. And that's when I thought, okay, I got to go back to Seoul. And so I tried my luck at the Changi Airport. I got my bosses to approve this. I went straight to Changi Airport from the hotel because the earliest flight out from Singapore was at 8 a.m. and I needed to get on that flight. I arrived at the airport and there was this really nice manager there who told me that he put me on standby. And so I had to wait until 7.25 when the gates closed before I was told that there was one seat available. And that's when I checked in, ran to get that flight because I knew I had to get there. Otherwise, the next one was a few hours away. And so I tried to get some sleep on the plane because I knew that it was going to be a very long day, a long week, because as soon as I arrived, I went straight to Itaewon, the scene site from the airport. And here's an excerpt from that live cross that you did as soon as you got there. CNN's Leong Suk joins us live from Seoul. Uh, Leong Suk, you are actually positioned where the worst of the crush took place. Uh, what's happening at the scene now? Well, yes, I am here in Itaewon right now. And um, as you can see, there are just local reporters here all covering this as this is a national tragedy for South Korea. And over there in front of where the local reporters are is that little alley, that alley where thousands of young South Koreans who are apparently parting there. Yun Suk, tell us about the Itaewon district, about that alley in particular. Our colleague, Julie Yu, she is from Seoul and she says her family home is five minutes away. Give us some context. 
Well, yes, I mean, Itaewon is a place for me where I've gone so many times since I was a teenager because it used to be a shopping area where Koreans or Korean Americans or anybody could go to and buy, say, American style clothes, fashion goods, since the main U.S. military army was located around there. And in fact, even now, I meet a lot of friends there, go over there on weekends when I'm craving for international cuisine or want to go to a bar there. And so I've walked that alley, the same alley. Down and up so many times over the last few decades. It is narrow. It's only about less than four meters wide. And on each side, there are also little shops that sell souvenirs or bags during the daytime. At night, they close and make way for the people to pass by. Now, on nights that I've been there, and that include previous Halloween nights, the whole Itaewon area will be packed. When you come out of this Itaewon subway station that's right in front of the Hamilton Hotel, you walk a few meters and there you have this narrow alley. You walk up that narrow alley and you come to this intersection and that's the main intersection where that whole line of street has bars and restaurants and that's where a lot of people usually go to. Now I think That street was just so packed that night that people started to move away from there and down to that narrow alley. And with the loud music blaring from all corners of the street and people who were standing at the bottom of that alley didn't really know what was happening and that the main street was fully packed. Because we do hear from people saying that they heard chants of people saying, go down, go down, telling people to go down further because that main street was just so packed. But I think people below could not hear them because there was still music blaring and it was just so loud and people were saying they couldn't even hear the person next to him. With all that happening, perhaps someone just fell, tripped, we don't know. And very soon, it was like Domino's witnesses were telling me. And so standing at that alley, I think a lot of the people below that alley were literally crushed because when the police came, they said they couldn't pull them out because there were just so many bodies on top of each other. There were even clubs that were still open and there were people inside dancing and partying while all of this was going on outside because they had no idea that this incident had taken place. And in fact, there's some people who were saying they only found out about this the next morning on the news. You talk about a metro station that's really just a stone's throw away. Masses of people just kept arriving without any sort of restrictions in place. Can you tell us about any sort of security personnel that were there? No, there were no security personnel, but this Itaewon station is just right in front of that Hamilton Hotel. It's a few meters away from that narrow alley, and according to reports, over 130,000 passengers used that Itaewon subway station that one day alone. Just that one station, but there are two other subway stations nearby, and data shows that a total of about 200,000 people were there that night. Now, the year before that, apparently there were only about 90,000 total. And that's why the police are saying that they were expecting about 100,000 people that night. Now, some experts here were saying that the subway station should not have allowed people to get off that subway stop since they knew that there were just going to be so many people that night. It was the first Halloween since there were no restrictions on this pandemic. And also, apart from the subway, there are also others who came in buses, private cars. And in fact, one taxi driver was telling the local media here that he warned a 20-year-old young female passenger passenger not to go because it was going to get dangerous, but she got off Itaewon that day. And so I think people realize if you've been to Itaewon in the past, you know what it's going to be like and you know how packed it was going to be. As you say, it was the first unrestricted Halloween event in that district in three years after COVID curbs were lifted, masks didn't have to be worn. So it's not surprising that young people were out in these huge numbers because they were celebrating in more ways than one, right? But the costumes, they added to the confusion, didn't they? Because some actually mistook a police officer as a party goer and ignored warnings. Yes, that's what we're hearing. Some witnesses were saying that when they saw the firefighters, the ambulances, the police, they just thought that they were just one of them in those costumes. And when the police were blowing their whistles, 
They all thought it was the same thing. They didn't take him seriously. And that's why it was very difficult and more difficult for the police and the firefighters who were actually there to be able to get to the scene. And also because this whole place was just so packed, the ambulances, the fire buses and all, they couldn't get to the scene on time. And there's literally a police station in front of Hamilton Hotel, a fire station there too, just next to that. And yet they couldn't get their way there on time to save those lives. A few days ago, I went to this gym where there were all the items that they have found around Itaewon. And you could see that there was a police uniform, a police cap. And so there were actually people wearing those costumes. And that's why a lot of people just thought that they were just one of those out there having a good time on Halloween night. At least 20 foreigners from 15 different countries died that night. And it really is so tragic when young lives are cut short. Stay with us. Up next on CNA Correspondent, more with Lim Yun-suk. Officials have apologized in an attempt to quell public outrage. How could police be so unprepared for the crowd? We'll talk about that after this. Hi, I'm Stephen Chia, and I host the new season of our podcast, Heart of the Matter. Join me in getting right to the heart of the headlines as we speak with experts and newsmakers to delve deep into the most talked about news developments. Look out for our episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to CNA Correspondent. We had an excellent guest on our news bulletin, Milad Hagani of the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of New South Wales. And he talked about the mechanics of what happens when people are packed so densely together. And he said misbehavior doesn't need to happen for tragedy to strike. Take a listen. When you're talking about crowds of hundreds and thousands of people, when you reach that critical levels of density, the effect that it has is that it makes the crowd act like a continuous body, like a fluid. No individual in the crowd is essentially in charge of their actions or their movements. No person can decide where to go or how to react. They are part of a continuous body that moves around. And in any moment of instability or turbulence, can propagate through the crowd, and people will not be able to stop that. In those circumstances, when it happens, there is very little or next to nothing that people can do. Yun Suk, the mayor of Seoul, has apologized because people are angry. He admitted that there's actually no proper crowd management policy in place. And even if more police were deployed that night, they wouldn't have known what to do. How can that be, especially given that South Korea is a country that is so strong on crowd control? Protests are highly organized with tight security. Well, yes, he and other government officials have been saying a lot of similar things. And in fact, the interior ministry is harshly criticized right now for having said that too. But looking at what happened that night, especially the calls made to the police by the people there that night, they were urgently seeking help and warning of something like this happening because among the 11 phone calls that night, many of them were saying, I think I am going to get crushed. Please help me. And yet the police did not send any police force to control this area. That the police chief has admitted its response was insufficient and that an investigation would be carried out. But Koreans and foreigners too, everyone here who have heard this, who were there and who were not there, are saying that because the police did not do its job, the government didn't protect its citizens, even after all those urgent calls were being made to the police asking and pleading for help because they were just saying that I'm going to get crushed. Please come and help. And yet nobody went there to help them. Now you're looking at live pictures here of the scene of the stampede. South Korean President Yoon Song yo is there. And Yoon Hap reported that President Yoon says it was so miserable to see this disaster in the heart of Seoul. Yeah, reports saying calls coming in as early as four hours before those fatal instances. Yun Suk, where does this all leave crowd control for types of events like the Halloween celebrations? Are there any solutions? 
I spoke to one professor, Chong Chang Sam, who teaches smart construction disaster management at Induk University, who said, unfortunately in South Korea, it's only after a disaster like this one that the government sees the need to do something about it. And in this case, the crowd management controlling the crowd in one area. But you know, the Seoul City Hall does have a system in place. It's a real monitoring system that uses mobile phone data to predict the crowd size. Like, for example, if I went into the system now, I would be able to see how many people there are near my office. It's there, but experts are saying that they don't think the Seoul City Hall officials checked it or saw the need to check it. They knew that about 100,000 people were going to be there, but I think a lot of people just thought, well, it's just going to be one night of Halloween partying and that'll be it. Also, right now, Apparently, a lot of the different entities like the Seoul City Hall or perhaps the Jeju Airport, they all have their own systems for their own purposes, but they're not integrated as one. So, for example, the City Hall would know and they would have it, but not the Seoul Police. But definitely, Professor Chung Chang Sang was telling me that systems like this, once in place and if used properly, it would definitely help prevent future disasters. And perhaps what happened at Itaewon may be the impetus needed to get it deployed more widely. Yun Suk, I remember seeing in one of your television packages a mother who went to identify the belongings of her daughter. And when she found her pair of black boots, she just broke down. And you could really feel the immense grief and loss as she clutched those shoes. What assistance is there going to be for families of victims? Well, the government and experts here are urging people to get help, whether they were at Itaewon that night or not. There are right now this mobile buses that's been deployed around where the memorial altars have been set up. And there are counselors inside waiting to help people with different trauma. But it's not easy for many South Koreans because there is this stigma still about seeking mental help. But the government is urging people to go. And I spoke to a lot of the witnesses and people who were actually there. And there was this one girl who was 30 years old and she went there with friends. There were six of them and only two survived, including herself. And she was saying she knows she needs to seek help because she wants to talk to somebody. And yet when I asked her if she was going to seek help, she said no, she wasn't going to go and see a therapist. And so there is this social stigma and government officials saying, yes, please go and seek help. And experts saying you need to, you need to talk this out. There is this, not just an individual grief, but also a collective grief that's going around here. Because I think a lot of people are still in shock and they just cannot believe that something like this could happen in the heart of the city. This is the country's worst tragedy since the Sewol Ferry disaster in 2014. In that case, more than 300 people perished, also many of them very young. They were students. yun you covered that disaster as well. How would you compare covering these very difficult stories? It's not easy. I think reporters all go through this trauma, too, if you have to cover disasters like this. But this is something that happened in Seoul and in an area where I often go to and I can still see myself. And in fact, if I was not in Singapore that night, I might have gone to Itaewon on that night, too. And so it's something that is very close to my heart. And a lot of my friends were saying that they were there that night, too. But being an adult, for people over 40, maybe, or knowing how packed it would have been, I don't think they would have gone to that alley, but most of those people who died and who went were in their 20s. And so it is heartbreaking. It is very difficult. But compared to that, this is something that's happening here in Seoul. And so I think a lot of people, especially in the capital Seoul, can look to this. And that's why when they come to the memorial sites, you see a lot of adults and elderly people just coming because they were living in Seoul. They just felt that they had to come and give their condolences or pay their tribute because they could not just stay home. While the sail ferry was something that happened outside of the capital Seoul. And also very different is that when I was covering the sail ferry disaster, there were people still missing. There were a lot of parents who were still looking for the loved ones. And there are some who were never even found, at least for this one, if I can say so, at least the bodies have been found. But it's going to be something that I think for a lot of Koreans, it's going to take a long time to get over. Indeed. Thank you very much, Yun Suk, for your insights on a story that will reverberate for years to come. Thank you, Teresa.
The TV version of CNA Correspondent airs on CNA every Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. You can also catch up with them whenever you like on cna.asia. Follow this podcast version that takes you behind the scenes with our correspondents so you'll know when a new episode is out. Our podcast team is made up of Daniel Lee, Crispina Robert, Clara Ong, and me, your host, Teresa Tang. Thank you for listening. 